Perfect. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, for another uh, lecture series. And so um, you're joining us here, Clem Arboretum and Botanic Garden. Uh, we're very um, happy to be hosting um, two webinars this week as part of Autumn at the Arboretum. Uh, and that's going on all week. It'll end on Friday. So if you haven't stopped out yet, come and take a look, do a, a little smartphone tour or a um, a, sm a smartphone scavenger hunt. It's our one of our newest things we've added this year. So you can kind of uh, look around the grounds and find some cool new plants and trees. And, uh, but for tonight um, and tomorrow as well, we've got another webinar. Um, we are happy to do these webinars, which are made possible by the Pauline J and John R. Cook Lecture Fund. Um, they help support these, um, these webinars or sometimes in person if we get back to a bit of normal, but um, we're happy to be able to uh, do this Zoom presentation from across the country, um, really. And um, that lecture fund is what helps us do that. And so for tonight's uh, presentation, uh, we are so lucky to be joined by Neil Peterson, and he's going to be teaching us all about pawpaws. He um, has fallen in love with pawpaws, is doing research and breeding, and um, has released several cultivars of different um, of different pawpaws that you can try. And so he's going to teach us all about this. Uh, amazing fruit, this native fruit. And um, just a few things about Zoom real quick. Um, you'll all be muted during the webinar, uh, but there is a, um, a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in. I'll be keeping an eye on them throughout the presentation. Um, we might do some questions uh, during, or we might keep them for the end, but feel free to type your questions in whenever you've got them. Um, and then in the chat box, um, Oh, of course, I put it in the wrong chat box. But if you can open up um, your chat box, um, a quick little poll question here is that we want to find out is who has uh, had a pawpaw paw before. Um, if you could just type that into the chat box real quick, uh, and we'll we'll see how many people have actually had the pleasure of trying one. Um, and so you can utilize the chat box for that, um, and then we'll uh, use either the chat box or the Q&A box um, to keep an eye on questions throughout the webinar. Um, and so it looks like we've got at least one person who's had them before. A few people haven't, but yeah, someone said um, they've had them just once, but they're not easily available. Um, recently, somebody had their first one, yay. Growing three mangoes, pawpaw, and have never tried one. Okay, somebody else is growing some right now, but they haven't had any fruits yet. This is great. And we we do have some pawpaw trees on our property at Clem. Um, and so if you're on your if you're out on the grounds, it's on our east loop, and we it is a part of our smartphone tour right now. So it's a a featured stop, so that way you can go ahead. You'll have to walk off the path a little bit into the turf and be able to get up close. I've been checking them. I haven't um, seen any fruit lately, but they do blend in uh, and hide pretty well as well. So um, you can check them out at our property. Uh, but I think that's all of the survey results we've got, Neil. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Here is uh, Neil Peterson. And um, again, if you have questions, mm -hmm. just type them into the box. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you'll probably learn more about pawpaws than you knew was possible tonight. Um, I've been doing this. Uh, I got, I was young. I was a grad student at West Virginia University. And I think the year was 1974. And that's when I tasted my first one. There's always going to be a first. Uh, so this is a slideshow we're going to go through. I hope the slides look as good on your machine as they do on mine. Uh, you can see that they can be very beautiful inside and all of them will be some shade of yellow from very pale perhaps to very deep golden. This is a picture of the native range that Albert Little put together based on herbarium records. 
So he only registered a county if there was an herbarium record showing it present in the county. Uh, and that accounts for why some areas look um, kind of uh, blank, like the lower Mississippi River, that valley there. Actually, we know from other uh, naturalists that uh, th that's full, you know, that's not kind of a blank area at all. So although it's deceptively precise as a map, it's uh, not going to be totally accurate. Uh, you can see now you're in Northern uh, Illinois, that is the Clem Arboretum is, and, but I expect it wouldn't be unusual to find some native pawpaws even going up into uh, Wisconsin. <clears throat> For Now, some of you may have traveled in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, these are some cousins of the pawpaw. None of them are hardy, but these are very popular around the world, particularly the cherimoya that you see in the bottom center cut open. Uh, that can be grown in Southern California. It's native to Ecuador and Peru. Uh, the guanabana is the spiny looking one, very big fruit that may weigh several to even three or five pounds on the tree and uh, very popular in the tropics. Uh, it's renowned for making, I think, some really nice drinks when it's mixed with, uh, when it's uh, watered down somewhat to make it uh, drinkable. <clears throat> now, my sp I'm going to go through some background on the pawpaw and some history before I go into where we are today. So it's, and I also welcome, uh, this will, uh, you could give some, write down some questions if you'd like them to be answered as we go through, because I think it's kind of hard oftentimes to hold a question to the end. So this is, I'm gonna cover some things that are mistakes. These are myths about pawpaws. And uh, as they get, get better known, they, they, Lord, they're getting better known than they used to be, but the, some of this still might be circulating. So one, it does not need a frost to be ripe. It, it, in fact, it typically, uh, it's the season is finished here in West Virginia, and we will be some weeks away from having our first frost. Uh, our season started in late August, very late August, and runs for about a month. Uh, although you'll find the trees growing in the shade, they're very shade tolerant, but they don't need to grow in the shade. In fact, you'll have much better fruit yields in the sun, uh, that the seeds and seedlings need shade. That is, how shall I put it? That's an exaggeration. The seedlings the first year, possibly the second year, benefit from some shade because they're just getting started, getting their roots established, but they don't really need shade. They just need good soil and good water. They are not the same thing as papaya. And there's going to always be some confusion around this issue. In the British former British colonies around the world, where, and papaya are being grown in Kenya and uh, <clears throat> the Ivory Coast, uh, I think, and Australia, these different places that papaya are being grown, and the Brits call them pawpaw. So naturally, if you're in Australia and you're talking about pawpaws, you're actually, you're meaning papaya, according the way we use the word. And that of course creates confusion. The trees where papaya trees uh, or herbs, the plants rather, they do come in separate sexes, but pawpaw trees do not. They have both sexes in off in the flowers on the tree. And not all pawpaws are alike, and nor do they come true to seed. Uh, for those of you familiar with Apples, for instance, you know that apples do not come true to seed. If the uh, seedling can be very disappointing from an apple tree. Uh, they probably will not be so disappointing from a pawpaw tree, but they won't be identical. If I go too fast, slow me down. Um, so here are some of the facts. Those are myths. <clears throat> it is North America's largest native edible fruit can weigh more than a pound, even in the wild. As the map shown, it's in many states, a total of 26. As I just explained, it's not a papaya. It's got a lot of personality. And if, since very few of you have eaten a pawpaw, uh, 
you you have to learn that you know in years to come but it can be very sweet and delicious and fortunately it is nutritious <clears throat> years past a century or more in the past uh it was when america was a very rural country and now we're very urban but back then it was pretty well known and there are quite a lot of places and towns named pawpaw in the eastern u.s I'm not alone in uh, collecting and propagating cultivars. So we now do have some superior cultivars and domestication is underway. And think of some of the other crops that have been domesticated. Um, <clears throat> apples obviously domesticated, their wild relatives come from Central Asia and Kazakhstan and peaches and oranges have their origins in China and they were much smaller fruits than today but they were very tasty, which is why people were interested. <clears throat> so as right away, people, when they taste these, they recognize, they think of the as tropical. It's like, oh, they look for words that might describe it. Maybe it's, you know, it's kind of like banana or it's got a little bit of pineapple in it or mango. The people who've already tasted cherimoyas and the other known as instantly see the resemblance and they say, ah, cherimoya. It's a soft texture and that surprises people who are only used to crisp fruit like Asian pears and many uh, honey crisp apples might be an example. <clears throat> Those are wonderful fruits, but they're crisp and crunchy and pawpaw instead is custardy. It's like flan, it's similar to avocado in texture. I don't have to read everything that's on the screen. I'll just highlight that this is high in minerals. It's similar to banana in terms of calories. So we, this, if people are looking to be on a diet, well, this may not wanna be on your diet if you're trying to cut back your calories. It has a, a protein level that's two or three times higher than most fruits you'd be eating, higher than an apple, uh, an orange or a banana. Uh, or definitely than grapes, but don't get the idea that you could satisfy your protein requirement from pawpaws. You have to have something much more, you have to have beans, you have to have dairy or meat to satisfy your uh, protein requirement. And this goes over why it's not been seen in the grocery stores. And one reason in, in kind of a nutshell is it's basically new. Up until recently, it's just been in the woods and that is not how you're gonna get fruit into the grocery store. We don't have orchards until recently, we don't have orchards. We didn't have superior cultivars that would have commercial qualities. And we also don't have a, a dis food distribution system that will work for a soft fruit. This is a fruit that's soft, easily bruised, and it's perishable. Uh, if you bring a ripe pawpaw into your kitchen and leave it on the counter, it will be in about three days, it'll be overripe. Now that's really perishable. You know, it maybe can compare to raspberries in perishability. Uh, however, if you refrigerate it, you can hold that ripe pawpaw certainly for seven days. And if it's underripe, you can hold it say for about three weeks pull it out of the refrigerator and let it finish ripening. So as I asked before by some people, you know, how did I get into this and how I'm in so deep, you know, it's like pawpaws have almost become my life. And uh, how did that happen? Well, it goes back to my time at West Virginia University. And I was a graduate student and I had a, a little research stipend for which I was a class instructor, a lab instructor in ecology. And we would go down, it would be September. So it was the first weeks of, of semester. And we'd go down to the Arboretum. This was the core Arboretum in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we were doing studies on small mammals, learning how ecologists can estimate populations of small mammals. And, um, but being that we were in the Arboretum and it was September and we were down in the forest along the Monongahela River, 
that was pawpaw season and there were pawpaws there. So I said, ah, oh, I've got to, uh, I've got to come back here on a weekend and sample my first pawpaw. And I did, and it just blew me away. Oh, the, just, the, the thought that there would be something just out there in the woods, you know, dropping out of the tree into the leaves to be picked up and eaten and so delicious. It was a revelation. And uh, at that point, I said, I've got to see if anything's ever been done with pawpaw by breeders because I was in a program, a gen, uh, master's program studying plant genetics. So that was kind of natural for me to be thinking about that. So this slide here shows the Journal of Heredity article that was published in 1916. And the editors of the journal were asking, where are the best pawpaws? And they were offering prizes. And it's been pointed out to me that $100 in 1916 probably had the buying power of about $2,500 today. That should catch people's attention. And they had some really good results from the contest. Because like I say, this is, we weren't such an urban society back then. And the news of the contest was going out to farmers across the Midwest and much of the, much of the Eastern country. <clears throat> and in the process, this is a list of cultivars that are no longer available. But you can see everything before 1925, the first column and plus a few others, were things that had been selected and named before the contest. And then we have Fairchild in 1925 and some others going up through the 30s, up into the 40s, and even a couple into the 1960s. But I do not think, I have not found them available in any nursery today, so they're extinct which is a shame when you're a plant breeder, you like to work with the best material you can find. And I figure the farmers in the Midwest who are out there hunting squirrel and mushrooms and wild fruit, they were also hunting wild pawpaw. And when they found a really good one, they took note and were going back year after year to that patch. So that was probably, that first column was probably some really good stuff but when I started my work, it wasn't available to me. In starting my work, I said, well, when you do any sort of breeding, it wouldn't matter if it was horses, dogs, or, or pawpaws, you need to start with the best stuff. You don't reinvent the wheel. So, you know, in doing my library research, I did find where there were historic collections. So in this map, those historic collections are the yellow triangles. And the blue circles, those are the prize winning trees for fruit quality. Uh, my eye is itching me for fruit quality. So I had to say, you know, can I find anything that's surviving from back then? And I'm glad to say what it was pretty much a difficult and, and un fortunate search because for instance what was out in Illinois that was Benjamin Buckman near Springfield and in Sangamon County and he was a noted uh, a breeder uh, pears many nuts different uh, fruits uh, and he was doing some work with pawpaws but when I went out and was shown the property by the extension agent well it was in corn and soybeans and no big surprise right uh, the only time that I found the really best stuff was here at the Blandy Experimental Farm, and that's in near Winchester, Virginia. And I live in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia now. At the time, I did not. At the time, I was <clears throat> uh, employed in Washington, D.C. with the USDA. And, but that puts me close to Winchester. So I actually found at this experimental farm and now it's the State Arboretum of Virginia, but it was founded in 1926. That they had been the uh, admin, the um, director had a great interest in many things plant-wise, and he had correspondence going on for decades and was being sent seeds from different cooperators around the country. And these were planted in the backwoods 
on the property. So they had never been cut down. And because they were not grafted, if you do a graft with pawpaw, eventually the top becomes old and senescent and dies and you lose the, the, uh, the important part of the plant that you're growing. But if it's a seedling, you don't lose it because it's on its own roots. So as this slide says, this is where I found the best stuff. And, um, <clears throat> and that was back around 1980. So actually how many years has it been since 1980? It's been, I guess it's been 40. The slide says 30, but now it's 40 years later. And these were, I mentioned three trees here that were the mothers of those, one, two, three, four, those five cultivars at the bottom. Those are cultivars for my work. This was the breeding work I was speaking of. And it was a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a lot of fun. And I couldn't have done it without all my friends and volunteers who helped me through the years. Harvest fruit, test it, taste it, um, one thing and another. But this is to show some of the difference that's between wild trees and your best uh, cultivars. Um, those cult those tr fruits on the left um, may taste really, really good. That probably like the one in the upper left could have been what I tasted, but you can see that it's small and it's as much seed as it is pulp. And then the one below it is terrible because it's mostly seed. And even if it tastes good, you might be happy in the wild, but you're not going to want to be growing that in your backyard and you're not going to want to buy it if it's in a grocery store. So what we're aiming for is something like this one on the right that has the little label says 858. And all my trees had numbers originally. 858 did become Rappahannock. So here you have a lot more pulp than you do seeds. So when you think about commercial prospects, and maybe most of you who are listening this uh, this evening, you know, aren't thinking along those lines. You're just you're, you're interested in what you can grow <clears throat> at your house. Um, but I was hoping that uh, the pawpaw seems so good to me. I said it should have a future right up along peaches and apples. You know, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to think in terms of production harvesting and markets. And we can, I'm glad to say that in terms of production, all the methods we use with other orchards and tree crops are very suitable. Uh, the harvest and shipping presents a problem as I've already mentioned about their softness and perishability. And markets, you know, that may not be so difficult. I mean, there is a challenge always to introducing a, a new fruit, but at the same time, when you offer something new, that can catch the attention of a customer. Uh, I wish my eye weren't bothering me like this. That's why I keep rubbing, you'll forgive me. Um, these were the four qualities that I wanted to examine all my seedlings. I had two orchards. I had about 1,500 seedling trees. <clears throat> And you, when you're doing plant breeding, you have to go for numbers because you're looking for something that's rare. <clears throat> I mean, if it weren't rare, people would have already discovered it and it would be out there. So you're looking for something rare. And I sometimes compare it to like, you're looking for an Olympic champion and those are not common. Okay. And <clears throat> to look among, you know, thousands of seedlings, you you have to have a focused, narrow bunch of objectives. The more objectives you place into your formula, the, the less likely it is that you'll find something that meets your requirements. But I knew that fleshiness would be important, the, a low seed to fruit ratio. Flavor is of utmost importance. That's why we're interested in it, not to mention the nutritional angle, but we wouldn't bother if it weren't a delicious fruit. If it could be less fragile, that's good. And for the farmer, you have to have decent yields. So I started <clears throat> collecting fruit, separating out the seeds, germinating it in 1981. 
And these got planted at the University of Maryland on their research stations. There was a, one on the east, east of the Chesapeake Bay, and there's one in the west of Maryland. Each of them was about an hour and a half drive from where I lived, but in opposite directions. So I've fortunately, with what I found, I didn't collect just from Blandy. I collected from Illinois and Pennsylvania, and some was along the Potomac River. <clears throat> but the the best they didn't produce the best seedlings. Okay, so I had a lot, and <clears throat> and that's why I was concentrating on those pawpaw collections from the first half of the 20th century. Also, because I figured if I could find out find anything from that period that was material that was in danger of being lost so the there were have been varieties started to be named and propagated in the 50s 60s and 70s but those were being handled by nurseries so those are not in danger of being lost and i'll put some names on those so it can seem concrete one of them is called sunflower that's a rather a standard one. Another overlease that was found in, Indi in Indiana. Uh, then there's some from New York State called Pennsylvania Golden. Well, the, the parents of those came from Pennsylvania. So John Golden, John Gordon, sorry, John Gordon called them Pennsylvania Golden. And with 1,500 trees and two different orchards, you know, I reached that point, like more pawpaws, oh no, we, but we had to taste them all because we wouldn't be a scientist otherwise. We, we didn't know if, you don't know until you taste them if it's going to be great or, great or terrible. So this is some pictures from that period of time. I had dark hair then, you see, I had dark hair and all those pictures. Now, now I'm gray haired. And these were some of the volunteers that have helped me over the years. This section of the talk is about the orchard information. The soils and climate, it's not all that difficult <clears throat> because we're in the humid east. We get, in a normal year, we get pretty plentiful rain. It, they'll grow from zone five, which puts it in southern Michigan, southern Wisconsin, going all the way down to the south Georgia. I would probably some people are growing them in around Gainesville, Florida, even closer to Orlando, but that's not a good area. But so a, a, from Georgia on north to southern Michigan is good. You'll get your best yields if you put them in full sun. They like moderate acid soil. And this is very important. You, they really do want well-drained soil. So heavy clays are probably not going to be so good. There's a, a picture of a seedling that was raised in a container. And the circle there is to show you where the bottom of the taproot is. And the taproot is just about as deep as the top is tall. It's <clears throat> pawpaws do not, uh, how to put it? They resent being transplanted. They're, they are not like apples. Apples are rugged individuals and you can just maltreat them and they'll still grow, but they just don't like to be transplanted. So do it when they're young. And you'll find as they get older, if you try to dig down and get all that taproot, you know, you're digging to China. Okay, keep the weeds away while they're young. Once they're growing vigorously and have some diameter to the tree, it's not a problem. But while they're young, keep that grass and other vegetation away. And be sure if you're in a dry spell, like I understand Illinois had this summer, water them probably every week. And not just to water it on the top surface, you know, put enough on that it'll sink down into the soil. If you're doing an orchard, and I'll be quick about this because I kind of anticipate you aren't, you all aren't doing orchards, but leave enough room between the rows that you can get your machinery up and down. And a windy site can be a problem. I know a friend on 
uh, Long Island, New York, and they get the wind off the Atlantic Ocean daily. And he tried to establish a small orchard and it failed. Between trees, you might do 10 feet, but it's, they're very forgiving. Like in a backyard, I've told people, well, you can just plant them two or three feet apart and they'll grow up and those kind of look like one big tree and they won't mind, they'll be happy. Um, fertilization, I'll just, I'll just almost run through this to the next slide because it's very much like other plants and trees. And uh, so stop me if I'm wrong, but keeping on here. Now, irrigation. This is necessary in a commercial orchard. I do not require it outside of a commercial orchard. But I've had, I know some people doing or orchards and they've had a drought summer and their fruits have suffered so much, you know, so they weren't getting much in the way of yields and sales. Um, or they were had a drought and then in Maryland, sometimes these tropical storms that were hurricanes, they just come up the East Coast and they dump a lot of rain. And he's gone through a period, Jim went through a period where he'd almost a month without rain. And then it came, you know, all at once and the fruit just blew up like water balloons and the fruit cracked. This happens to apples and peaches. It's not peculiar to pawpaws, but it typically happens when you've had dry spells followed by a lot of rain. I've mentioned weed control, right? Okay, I should mention that pawpaw by its biology sends out root suckers. Uh, and by this, we mean, you know, it could be two, three, four feet away from the trunk of the tree and up comes a strong pawpaw. It's not, <clears throat> uh, by strong, I mean, it has vigor, but a lawnmower just will just cut that right down because it's not tough at all. Now, this is both the pluses and minuses of pawpaws. I think the zebra swallowtail butterfly is a plus. It is so beautiful. It's, a, it's just the same size as a um, <clears throat> tiger swallowtail. It's a little stronger flyer. That's a picture of it there. It's larvae, which are the caterpillars in the second picture. They feed only on pawpaws. And <clears throat> they can, if you have a small tree that's only about 12 or 18 inches tall, now they might defoliate that. But you get a tree that's a little bigger, you know, three feet tall, five feet tall, you will probably not even notice the damage on a tree of that size. So I know some people who are into butterfly gardening and they love to have the pawpaw trees just so they can have the butterflies. <clears throat> now the bottom picture is a tiny little moth larva. There, you, I'm, there are my fingers holding the flower, the petals have been pulled away. And in the very center, you might see two little white grubs. Well, those are caterpillar larvae. And it's a little moth called the pawpaw peduncle borer. And I have seen a few settings in which it just decimated the, uh, <clears throat> the flowers on the tree because the flower is killed by this. Uh, their life cycle is such that they burrow down the flower stem into the wood and burrow down in the wood that doesn't appear to do any damage that I've ever seen to the tree, but they pupate inside over winter and then they come out in the spring and start the cycle all over again. This is one that I don't like. It's the pawpaw webworm because it does all this ugly damage. Now, that picture of the plant will, will um, <clears throat> fool you because it doesn't look like pawpaw leaves. Well, that's a, that's a related pawpaw that grows in Florida, only in Florida. But even there, this webworm is there and it attacks the, at the, near the end of the summer season, it attacks the leaves on the end of the branches and rolls them up with its silk and feeds on them. And it's very ugly. All I can say on the plus side of this is that it comes at the very end of the growing season and so the plant has done most of what it's gonna do. And I don't think overall the damage is great, but you obviously can cut that sort of thing off uh, and destroy it. There are fungal pests and these are some good pictures that show it. The one is uh, a phytosticta, 
And it's only on the surface, it's cosmetic, but it does have a problem that the skin, once it's infected with phyllosticta, becomes tough and hard. So as the fruit expands in size, that part of the skin cannot expand and it cracks. And of course, now you'll get diseases setting inside the pulp of the skin. And so I've seen yellow jackets come to those cracks to feed. And so that's a ruined fruit, yeah. The bottom picture is of sun scald. The pawpaw, unlike peaches and apples, where you want to try to get sun onto the fruit to color it up. No, the pawpaw wants just to be in the shade because it doesn't color up. Now, uh, pruning. Yep, you can prune these trees. I think they take to pruning very well. I should have another picture of that. There we go. There's pruning, particularly in the bottom picture. That's me in the, sitting in the bench. And on either side are two trees that are over 10 years old. And I've pruned those every year. If I hadn't pruned them, they'd be twice as tall. And the uh, top picture is of the Jim Davis orchard. And he prunes his trees so that he can harvest the fruit more easily. You know, commercially, I recommend that. Uh, because pawpaw is not one you want to be up on ladders. <clears throat> the wood is soft and bends and it's, it's just not like apple. Uh, however, if you're in for your own personal use, uh, you can just let the fruit fall out of the trees. When it falls, it's fully ripe and you don't have to be up on a ladder and you don't have to prune. So now I can talk about flowering and pollination. The flowers, those are two different views of them, but that's what they look like. They're pendant and they hang down. They're sort of these little maroon colored bells. And when they open up in the spring, the flowers start first, the petals are green. And you can see in that top picture that there are, there's a green flower in the corner of that picture. And then as they mature, they get the pigment. And uh, at the very earliest time, as they turn from green to maroon, they're female and they're receptive of pollen. Uh, then after that's over, and that may take two or three days, then the, pollen, the stigma will turn brown. They can't receive any more pollen, but the anthers themselves at that point open up and release pollen. And that's the picture with the fly. So you can see the pollen being released and the fly is one of the uh, little insects that pollinate pawpaws. Bees do not visit pawpaw flowers. They're the wrong color and the wrong odor and they just fly right past them. There is, however, nectar in there. There's a nectar reward on the inner petals. And so that's what the flies are coming for. Um, you can get some decent yields off of these trees, 30 pounds per tree at maturity, but just remember that there will be windfalls and drops. And so it's not totally everything you can sell. You'll learn as you grow your own pawpaw trees that there's not much of a visual clue for when to pick. But the more time you spend with them and feeling them, you'll get the hang of that sort of softness like maybe a peach. Uh, when it can be removed from the tree. Or as I said before, uh, a, a ripe pawpaw just falls right off the tree into the grass. And it's good to have that stage of grass under them because it cushions the fall. Or the, here was one lady who had a brilliant idea. I think she was also trying to keep the raccoons away from her pawpaw fruit. <laughs> so she used pantyhose. <laughs> I wish I was there in person so I could hear you all laughing about pantyhose. Uh, I think it's a pretty cool idea. And then, then the fruit never hits the ground and bruises and it may even keep the fungus off. I should experiment with this. Okay, well, this is repeating some things I already mentioned. And so I'll just kind of skim this one. We're very fortunate that pawpaws refrigerate at 35 degrees. You can just put it in a normal refrigerator. I say fortunate because it's cousins that are from the tropics like Cherimoya. They receive damage, I think, 
at about 55 degrees or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this is good. This is good for us. I'll talk about some of the cultivars. Okay, I mentioned there were some old ones like from the 50s and 60s. Um, so some of those old ones don't have much, they're, 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 we'll note that they're old, but not that they're good. Like Wilson, no, uh -uh. Uh, I, I told a friend, I said, why would you buy Wilson? Well, if you like small fruit that's seedy and not very good flavor, but the tree bears a lot, oh, you'll want Wilson. Wells is actually isn't bad. Mitchell is no, I don't recommend Mitchell, but here's the best of the old ones. I mentioned Overly Sunflower, Pennsylvania Golden, and there's one from Niagara, Ontario called NC1. Now, here are my um, seven. I've named them all after some of our native rivers that bear Indian names, and that seemed very appropriate to me. This, this tree, this fruit species is native to North America, and it was much eaten by the native Indians and, uh, and likes to grow near water, near the rivers. Um, I say exceptions to Rappahannock because it's not performing well all across the country. It has not performed well in Kentucky, for instance. But Kentucky State University uh, is a university that has a dedicated research program about pawpaws and they have a germplasm repository there. So they've released three varieties they call Atwood, Benson, and Chappelle, and they're all good. And there's Mango and Green River Bell and Shawnee Trail and others as well. I can't go into that in this type of talk, but they're out there. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the particulars about a couple of mine. These were why I favored Shenandoah because it has good yields. It's a sweet, mild flavor. It's a very good variety for somebody who's one, you know, just getting into pawpaws. Uh, it has that good seed to fruit ratio, only 6%. By contrast, a wild pawpaw will often be like 14% seed. And some of them I've seen have been 25% seed. So we're getting, I think a good pawpaw should always be less than 8% seed. And I did sell at farmer's markets for about three years, and it was very, this was the popular one at the market. Susquehanna is my personal favorite, but don't be swayed by that because everybody has personal favorites. You know, you know that with apples, for instance. Um, this is very fleshy. I think this is my lowest seed to fruit ratio of 3%. Uh, and it's very sweet and it has a rich pawpaw flavor. It's rather than being kind of custardy, it might be better to say it's kind of a buttery texture, very large. The yields are moderate. It's a late ripening one. It does okay here where I'm in West Virginia, maybe in Northern Illinois, maybe the season wouldn't, you don't know until you try, but you know, you may be having a shorter growing season. Um, and when you sell at a farmer's market, uh, you'll find that you can ask a pretty good price for pawpaws. I think right now, quite a few people in the Midwest are offering them for $8 a pound. This was San Francisco, this picture, $5 a pound, and those weren't even cultivars. Those, I consider those inferior pawpaws in that basket. But because they're unusual and not available in San Francisco, I'm sure he was had customers for all of them. And this is in some ways is the key, key slide because to get people, because people don't know what a pawpaw is. So what is it? How does it taste? So education is the key and, <clears throat> and fruit free fruit samples are the key to that. Once they taste them, you get a lot of converts who are happy and eager to buy. You can, I, I should say, where it says information sheets and recipes, yeah, that's a very good thing to have if you're at a farmer's market. Gourmet restaurants can be another outlet. If the, if the chef shows an interest, um, we do have, you know, obviously we're still in the earliest stages of turning a, the wild, 
our wild pawpaw that is so distinctively American, but into a commercial crop. Um, think of some of the other American crops that have become commercial. There's pecans, that's strictly American. Blueberries, that's American. Cranberries is, are American. Sunflowers, I mean, granted, I guess most of us don't eat sunflowers raw, but you know, that's an American crop too. And so I see still a lot of development needs. Um, we have an orchard in Maryland. We have some others started up. There's one in Ohio, which what does he call, what's he call himself? I forget, doesn't matter, does it? He's up near Cleveland. Um, there's quite a few breweries interested in making pawpaw beer. Maybe that's good. I know from my own experience that pawpaw ice cream is delicious. That is like one of, the, if you wanna find something to make from your pawpaws, that's excellent. Probably things like cheesecake and flan are good too, but don't do pawpaw leather because people keep thinking of doing that and then they get sick. Something happens when the pawpaw pulp is being dried. I think maybe the fatty acids are going rancid. Something's happening and people get very sick and vomit from eating pawpaw leather. So you just have to realize you're dealing with a, a new fruit and it may behave differently than other fruits. So Kentucky State University is concerned about many of these items to have a better way of processing the fruits so you can separate the skins and seed. You know, if we had cultivars with thicker skins, certainly avocados have a nice thick skin, that would make them less perishable. If you had what's called a color break, and apples often and peaches display that, where the skin is turning to a new fresh color, often yellows and reds, which just tells us visually that's ready to pick. So that would be really handy. Uh, tissue culture propagation, I'd love to have that because then I don't think I'll put, ask you know, anything in particular. How should I put it? I don't think I'll go into great detail, but it's to address the problem of grafting. So you graft your pawpaw onto a seedling root stock. So the same methods that's used with, with grapes and with apples and peaches, many things. And then your root stock starts to sucker and everything that comes up, whether it's one foot, two foot, three feet away from the tree is from the roots. It's not the top that you're growing. And the reason you're growing the top is because that gives you the high quality fruit and you could get very low quality fruit from the suckers. If you had tissue culture, then these, these um, plants and plantlets would be on their own roots. Genetically, it would be the same organism. So any suckers that came up would also be just like the top. I think that I'm waiting for that to be, um, <clears throat> to be conquered and solved. I mentioned KSU. There's Dr. Pomper in the white hat. And those are the things they're doing over there. Here are some organizations. Uh, I did, let's see, they're festivals. I'll start at the bottom. The number of festivals now around the country, the oldest one is in Ohio, Athens, Ohio. And that started, I think, in 1999. But I know there's one in Frederick, Maryland, uh, the Netherlands, yeah, there's interest overseas in pawpaws. Pen York, New York, Pennsylvania, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Iowa, I think that's Muscadine, Iowa, which may not be all that far from you all. And where is it in, oh, in Morgantown, West Virginia, yeah. So, um, and then every, about every four years, there's an, a, uh, a conference at Kentucky State University that draws in uh, scientists and growers and, and just fanatics, pawpaw fanatics. The North American pawpaw growers, they have a website and that can be helpful. I have a website, which is petersonpawpaws.com. And that's a bit of a clearinghouse. I do not personally sell the trees. I'm too old to be doing that. But I have licensed nurseries around the country. 
that are raising and selling my varieties. And there's, of course, the, a website for KSU. And then on Facebook, there are four different uh, web, uh, not websites, but groups, four different groups. It's hard to believe. Wow. And some of these are more international. Okay. It is a craze. There are also some books. And um, these are all very good books. The one in the middle is the, is the longest book and really goes into the historic looking at the historical picture and the people over the decades or even century that have done something to promote Paul Paul. The Blake Cothran book is in the, on the right-hand side. That's the latest one to come out. <laughs> so this is what a friend told me once. You know, what do you do after Paw Paw season and you finished grieving? Oh, you poor guy. So that's the end of my show. This is one of those places in America that was named for the pawpaws, the pawpaw bends of the Potomac River. And that name was probably attached, you know, oh, about 150 or more years ago. Um, I guess it's gonna be time for question and answer. Let's see if I know how to share this off. Let's uh, shut down the, do I need to shut down the program for this? Um, you could keep it open. That's fine. Okay, we'll uh, keep it open. It's a pretty picture, isn't it? It is. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, we do have some questions here. Um, and so let me pull those up. And so somebody has asked, I've had a pair of pawpaws planted in full sun for about eight years. They've grown about five inches or less. What am I doing wrong? Lordy, lordy, lordy. Um, my first thought is the soil. Yeah. And maybe wheat, maybe wheat and grass competition. You can't have that. But you know, that's a terrible story. Uh, it's hard. We doctors can't diagnose over the telephone. So <laughs> those are my thoughts though. Do they, you know, maybe the soil doesn't have drainage, or maybe it's really too acid, or maybe it's alkaline. Pawpaws do not like alkaline soil. We'll even die for it, you know, so um, I wish them luck. Yeah. Um, another question here is, do you anticipate more cold hardy varieties being developed? Yes, that takes time. I do know that they're, but they mustn't, uh, don't be afraid to try because people are successfully growing pawpaws in Massachusetts and Vermont. There's some people up in Minneapolis who are growing them successfully. So if, if, if depending on where our person is uh, playing in from, they may be able to do it. Yeah, and then kind of um, continuing with that, somebody had mentioned um, Northern Illinois, which is where we're found. Um, uh, didn't see us on that county map, which you said was potentially outdated, but what are the climate requirements for cultivating them? You kind of touched on it, but. Yeah, uh, the, and, and the person writing is from Northern Illinois, I yes. take it. Yeah, the climate's fine in Northern Illinois. It's, it's going to be excellent. Of course, you all had a drought this summer and that's not excellent, yes. but, <laughs> but you have to irrigate during such times. Uh, until the plant is growing vigorously. It can grow quite vigorously. In my orchards, uh, I can see three feet of growth every year on the tree, once it's established. You won't see that, of course, in the early years. Uh, the, but the emphasis is on having good quality soil with fertility and don't have weed competition. Um, beyond that, I mentioned drainage, you know. That's all good, they're, they're good for the climate. Yeah, great. Um, and then let's see. Um, are your pawpaws, I'm assuming the cultivars you've done, are they grafted? Yes, they are. Okay, all on the same type of rootstock or? The, the grafting is done, nurseries do it and they use a uh, seedling rootstock. So it's no particular, unlike apples where you have mauling six and mauling sure. three. 
we don't have that with pawpaws. These are all an assortment of seedlings, but no particular type of seedling. Sure. It does have to be pawpaw, it does have to be a semina triloba, but not beyond that, it's nothing special. Okay, very interesting. Um, someone is asking, uh, Josh is asking, I heard pawpaw are deer proof, is that true? Well, that I didn't touch on that. Uh, that's a real good question. Uh, the deer do not like to eat the leaves. They will eat the fruit when it's fallen, but I do not see deer, you know, um, searching around in the branches looking for the fruit. They wait for it to fall. Okay, there is a problem and it can be severe, which is the bucks with their developing antlers and they want to rub the velvet off. And they will just, if the tree is of the right size, not too small and not too big, they'll just run their antlers up and down the trunk, ripping off the bark. I've seen they will break branches in the process. It's the bucks. And once the trees get of a big enough size, they are too stiff. They're no longer interesting to the bucks. They like to have the challenge of a tree that bends and gives and pushes back a little bit. So yeah, you have to watch out for that. And I, um, I have pawpaws in the woods close to the house here and the deer come through every day untouched. And, and voles and rabbits do not eat the bark either. I mean, these are good pluses and I should have said something about that. Yeah, um, along similar lines, um, do you tend to have issues with other wildlife, raccoons or anything getting to your fruit before you can or? They will. Yeah. Yep, yep, they, they will. The, pot, the raccoons and possums can climb up into the trees uh, and that'll frustrate you because they may take the fruit before it's ripe yeah. for us, you know, what we exactly. consider ripe. Uh, what you don't want are bears. That may not be a problem where you are. <laughs> Luckily, but I've heard not so some much. <laughs> people down in Tennessee, when they climb into the tree, and they'll climb into the tree to get the fruit and they break branches because um, they're too heavy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Ooh, I couldn't Probably not that. a problem where you are. Not so much. We get the wanderer once in a while, but that um, is definitely not in the norm. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And let's see. All right. Another question here. Um, could you tell us where the name comes from? Do you know the oh, history of that? Um... The, that's not known with certainty, um, and it'd be nice if it were. It's, it's speculated that it's because of the Spanish conquistadors who were the first Europeans to travel through Southern USA before it was USA, obviously, before the English had arrived. That was under Hernanda, Hernandez Cortez, and he had a, a, a regiment of soldiers and a couple missionaries with him. And they landed at Tampa, Florida, and they traveled north into what's South Carolina, and then they headed west. So they went over the, uh, the Blue Ridge, the, the Smoky Mountains, I suppose, and traveled west all the way to the Mississippi. And there, the mis missionaries kept journals, and they mentioned that in some of the villages, Indian villages they stopped at, there were groves of trees which were, had a fruit that was very fragrant like royal plums. And uh, well, then we, I, then it's kind of thought that the soldiers that were there and they were coming up from Cuba because Cuba was a Spanish base for all the colonies in the new world. And that well, they were familiar with papaya in Cuba. And there is some thought that because of the Spanish connection, this native tree, which only had Indian names at that point got called Papa, it's not, it's just speculation because we don't really know. Interesting. Yeah, that would be nice to know for sure uh, how it got there. Um, another question here, what is the lifespan of an old papa? Varies a lot, as you might expect. Um, it could well be over 40 years. Oh. Yeah, but I'm thinking at 40, you probably, they've reached old age. Okay, sure. And then um, 
Another question here is where do I get pawpaw trees from? Um, the question is asking if there's anything relatively locally, which I personally um, don't know from looking at your website, you might have some yeah, links can, of where to find them. I can them. help out there. Um, Stark, Stark Brothers is not too far away over in Missouri and they yeah. carry Peterson pawpaws. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And Forest Keeling also is in Missouri. Ellsbury, Missouri, both of these are on my website. So Eastern Missouri is not too far away. And you might find, I wonder if um, Tom Wall, he's at, near Muscadine, uh, Iowa. And I think his farm is called Red Fern Farm. I don't know that he's carrying my pawpaws, but he's been raising pawpaws and other fruits for decades and very knowledgeable. Uh, so you might, he might be selling trees. Uh, the, going the other direction, the closest place would be in Michigan, which is the Nash Farm, uh, Nash Nursery, uh, Owasso, Michigan. That's in my website too. And that's petersonpawpaw.com? Um, no, uh, yeah, my website is petersonpawpaws.com. It's not, not Peterson's apostrophe S, just petersonpawpaws.com. Okay. Okay, I'll type that in the box. Here, yeah, and but... it, it's it's chock full of information. So you want yes. to, there is a, a, a menu item which is called purchase and which leads to a list of nurseries. Yeah, great. And also um, on his website, because I definitely uh, was looking at that uh, before reaching out to you, but that list of um, links and additional information is, um, it's really long. There's so many great links um, in on that part of your website as well. Oh, you know what? Yes, there is. You know what I should do here too is see if I back up to the links, huh? Yeah, that'd I be perfect. Just, I could just back up to there. Yes, there perfect. Yeah, that's great. Um, now a question that came off here, um, kind of going off of the question about the lifespan of a pawpaw, but how does yield taper off with age and what's the peak age of production? What did, uh, repeat, please. Yes. Um, how does yield of the fruit taper oh. with age and what's okay. kind of the peak age mm -hmm. for production? Yeah, um, the, the tree will probably, um, okay, let's see, there's a couple parts there. One is that uh, since I prefer cultivars, uh, these are grafted and the cyan is already mature in the cellular composition. That kind of makes shape sense because I mean, we as people start out juvenile and we don't mature sexually till we're what, about 16, 18, something like that, yeah. And trees go through that too. They have a period of juvenility and then they become mature. Uh, and for pawpaws, a seedling takes about seven or eight years to become mature. But a grafted tree, you just need it to grow big enough to have the reserves to produce fruit. And that's about four years. Oh, Another okay. reason to grow <laughs> grafted trees rather than grow seedlings, that you may get fruit in four years as opposed to eight years. And a seedling, you don't know the quality, what the quality of fruit is going to be until it ripens, where you're pretty much guaranteed with a grafted tree. Uh, now the answer is, so how about the big yields? When do the big yields come on? They probably for a grafted tree, probably come on at about year eight and then will continue easily for, for another 10 years. And if you prune and do, do proper care and fertilizing, you know, you can keep it in good production for many years. Yeah. Um, and um, another question here is, what's your opinion on the mango variety? Um, okay. I've not tasted every pawpaw that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> I've not tasted mango. Okay. Uh, I can tell, but I have good friends who have and tell me about it. And a number of things they tell me. One, they say it's a very vigorous tree. Okay. Now I'm thinking of my friend in North Carolina. I will just assume that it'll also be vigorous in Northern Illinois. It's a very vigorous tree compared to the others. He said, and the fruit is big and he likes the taste, but he says it very quickly becomes, it goes over the hill, that perishability. He says at that point, it becomes watery. 
and it's not so attractive. Uh, and he's comparing it to other cultivars. Sure. So it's got pluses and minuses. Yeah. Um, and another question um, from what I've learned and read about um, pawpaws is the cross pollination with different um, cultivars. Mm -hmm. um, can you touch on that a little well, bit? That I, I glanced over that too fast on the slide. <laughs> um, that it takes, um, it really takes two uh, separate plants, genetically separate plants for good pollination. Uh, most pawpaws will give you some fruit just on their own with just their own flowers on the tree. But the work they did in Kentucky State University showed that, and they were doing hand pollination and bagging the flowers after they pollinated, that if they cross pollinated the flowers, one tree to a different variety tree, the yields tripled over when they just self pollinated. So it is really a good idea to have more than one type. And once again, if you're, uh, if you're uh, short on room, you know, you could plant two trees very close together and, but uh, you would, then you would have your two, but it wouldn't take up much more room. Yeah. And um, so this question, I kind of touched this question came through at the same time, um, similar um, about having a seedling. So if they've got all these suckers coming up, um, mm -hmm. do you recommend removing those um, and just yeah. sticking to the- I typically do. Some, in some garden settings, the people are actually aiming to get that look of a patch. Sure. You know, uh, it won't be as thick as a bamboo patch, but it, 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 with those tropical leaves, it can be very dramatic and beautiful and then they turning yellow in the fall but in an average setting no you would just mow off of those suckers when they come up sure. and they're, they're not stiff and tough and they mow down right away sure um and and you kind of said with in the research with um Kentucky that they were bagging them after hand pollinating. Would you recommend trying to do some hand pollination in order to increase I know people even who, with two? Yeah, I know people who do that with, with very happy with the results. Sure. Um, I kind of, and then I know other people who said um, they, you know, one year they did hand pollinating and they were happy because they were now getting fruit. They said, the, and they said something like, and the following year I didn't, bother and I got lots of fruit. So then the native insects were at work apparently. Sure. Well, that's great. Yeah. I, I know we don't get too many um, out at Clem. We do have sh the straight species. So um, mm -hmm. we should definitely look into some cultivars, I think. Um, and they've, they have started to colonize. So they are kind of stretching back into the wood, but woods yeah. um, of that area, but yeah. not, not too much fruit, but yeah. Mm -hmm. A neat tree though, definitely. Uh, like you said, with the tropical leaves, it, it's a nice landscape tree, but it'd be neat yeah, if we can nice, get some more fruit. I mean, some people, yeah, I think it's a nice landscape tree. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions here real quick. Read through the, I will read through this. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, and so, oh wait, just kidding. Um, I apologize, Josh has another question. Does the wood have any uses? Um, not really. <laughs> it's a very light wood. It's almost as light as balsa wood. Okay. Um, um, for that reason, this is a little historical tidbit. Um, the Flat boaters who came down the Ohio River in, you know, uh, 1800 uh, would uh, select their poles from the pawpaws along the banks. And, you know, they would have like a 10 or 12 foot pole, right, to push the barge of uh, the flat boat along. And they would use, they preferred to use pawpaws. And I know it was because the wood was light. So it wasn't, you know, they weren't taxing themselves with heavy wood sure, to do sure. the pushing. 
Interesting. That's I don't, a historical tidbit. I don't think we're doing that today. No, that's okay. That's that's something. Oh, I, never I guess would there have is known. one other thing. But yeah. This is this is. I mean, no, it's not like woodworking, but uh, there's an old old custom in Appalachia of making pawpaw whistles that oh. you you cut a, a branch of a certain diameter, you know, a little bigger than your fing, index finger, you know, and you you uh, when the bark slips, you can pull the bark away, and then you do the whittling to make the little the little uh, groove to blow through and the little notch for the whistle yeah. effect, you know, and you put the bark back on and you have a huh. whistle. Well, that's interesting. I need to put um, that and, on my website. <laughs> with, um, with along the same lines, so with the There's lightness- There's a video of, about pawpaw whistles. If oh, someone there? wants to go on YouTube, you can find a video on making a pawpaw whistle. Awesome. We'll have to do that. Um, Kind of along the same lines with um, the the lightness of the wood. Um, are the branches brittle and prone to breakage usually? Branches are very supple. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're not prone to breaking. And you, you, I do recommend not overloading a branch with uh, clusters of fruit. Sure. Uh, say bec by, because you hand pollinated. Okay. I mean, typically what happens is that the branch just bends way down because it's holding the weight of the uh, fruit where, um, and I think that's part of the evolution and biology of the tree that it's sure. adapted to that. Yeah, because you can have a cluster that might have say five fruit in it. And so the total cluster might weigh more than three and a half pounds and it's hanging on a branch, but the yeah. branch is bending way down, you know? Yeah, yeah. Very, um, a very good ad adaptation then um, yeah. for that. And like you said, with the, uh, for, for those who might not have, um, you know, seen them growing before, but um, you mentioned that the fruit likes to be in the shade. And I've noticed that the clusters are always hidden right up underneath the leaves. Yeah. So they, right. they get that shade themselves. Yeah. And when you go to the, I mean, so many people write in these Facebook groups and they say something like, well, I've been walking by pawpaw trees all my life and I didn't know it. And I said, I didn't know there was fruit up there. And they didn't know it because you look up into the tree and the fruit is green and the leaves are green and you don't it. Blends. It blends. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they hibernate very well. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of concentration when I've tried to find them before, so. Very neat. Well, that was the last question that I'm seeing. So I, I do want to say thank you again for doing this presentation. We really appreciate um, your time and sharing your knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. Me um, too. All thank of, you. Yeah, all of his website um, information is here on the screen. So make sure you write that down. Um, we're going to, this is a recording. So uh, we'll post it on our, right. our website um, in a few days or a week or so. Um, mm -hmm. So if you think any of your friends might be interested, uh, make sure to let them know to check it out so that they can um, see this as well. And then, as I mentioned, we have another webinar tomorrow evening about landscaping for winter interest um, as we near that season. Um, and that'll be tomorrow night at six o'clock as well. You can, um, you'll have to register through Zoom to get the link again. Uh, but that's still open and available. And again, if you haven't made it out to Clem yet for Autumn at the Arboretum, uh, come on out sometime this week, um, free admission through Friday. Um, but if you can't make it this week, come out anytime, nine to four daily, and um, just kind of watch the, the fall colors will really start changing here um, in the next uh, couple of weeks, I'm thinking. So definitely a beautiful time to come. Uh -huh. Maybe Clem should highlight some of the native species that have become crops. Uh, pecan is one, and there are northern pecans uh, that grow, uh, would grow for you. Yeah. And, uh, and hickory has not really become a crop, but you know, some of those native food plants, the blueberries, yeah. et cetera, that might be an interesting thing to have at an arboretum. That would be. I'll have to do some research into that and kind of learn a little bit more. That's, that's really neat. And um, you know, so there's some people who would, I think some people would probably help you from the Northern Nut Growers Association. Oh, true. true. I don't have that on the list on the screen, but uh, Northern Nut Growers have been in existence from 1911 and uh, are the focus of a lot of uh, amateur and some scientific interest. Huh. Very cool. I'll have to check them out and look them up and, and yeah, do that. Yeah. 
I love good. pecans, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you as well. And um, have a great evening. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if we've got any questions that come in, I'll make sure to uh, pass them your way. That'd be good. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Okay.